Well, uh, good morning to the few, the, the few of us that are, are already in the room. I'm sure more people will come, come around in the, in the next minutes, but it's time to start. I'm Manu Fernandez. I was not supposed to be here, but it was a last minute change, change with the moderator, or the, with the expected moderator that could not um, come to the conference and, well, I'm I'm here for those kind of for those for those kind uh, of things. Anyway, I'm really happy to moderate this uh, this session because I think it's well a step forward for the Congress uh, to go into these kind of topics about uh, safety, about uh, security, about wondering what kind of uh, privacy issues and concerns we have to uh, take care of it if we want to be seri serious about uh, smart cities, so it's, let's take it, or, it's, or this year is somehow an experiment on how these kind of topics integrate into the whole, the whole discussion of the, of the Smart City Expo. And that's the, the topic of this, of this session. It will be a session of four uh, speakers. We were um, talking before the, before the session about the different perspectives we are bring, bringing to the table. When we are thinking about uh, uh, building uh, safer cities, we have to think uh, in a broad sense, and probably we have to integrate different perspectives about how, uh, what kind of security we, we can envision and what concerns we have to take care uh, in, in the next years if we have to be, uh, we have to, we, we want to build, um, safer cities. That's uh, the topic of the session. We are starting just uh, now, just a reminder, maybe you, you, you could see it before, um, about um, an alternative way to raise your questions. Of course, you have your, uh, the microphones on the floor um, when after the presentations there will be a time for questions and answers. The, the microphones will be open, of course, and you, you just have you just need to go to the to the microphones and raise your questions, but you also have the chance to go to the app of the Congress, and there's a um, uh, somewhere in, in in the app where we can you can also write your questions, and that will be answered or will be discussed in the uh, from from the panel. If you don't have the app, you can even um, go to the website of the Smart City Expo World Congress dash um, ask and vote. And you will also you will also have the chance to to write your questions. That's more or less the the, the way the the session will work, and we can start with the with the four with four uh, speakers. Cesar, your turn. Good morning. Uh, I will be talking about cybersecurity problems in smart cities. So I'm CTO for IOCTIV Labs. So I work uh, doing research on cybersecurity, technical research, and I also uh, do management. And I'm board member and one of the founder of SecuringSmartCities.org, which is a nonprofit organization to deal with cybersecurity in smart cities. If you want to check it out, it's, there's uh, really good resources there. So when we talk about technology, uh, which is the core smart city, right? Because with the technology, you make the city smarter to, to provide better services, faster, to make uh, citizens happier. So there are a lot of security problems associated with technology. So because I don't have much time, I try to focus on what are the main problems uh, with cybersecurity on technology. So the main problem is that most technology being used is insecure. And this insecure technology is being deployed worldwide on all the cities, which is, uh, um, which is dangerous because by doing so, what you do is you are opening up your city to possible cyber attacks because all this technology do what we call the attack surface it grows the attack surface. I mean, the possibilities that cyber attackers have to target your city infrastructure, your technology. So why the, the technology is insecure? 
Well, there are many factors. One is because uh, there is a fast time to market. So usually uh, companies want to get a product out there soon. They have a competition issue. They want to be the first. They are interested in making a profit on, on selling the solution. And security takes time and money. So they always think about security later if it's really needed, if customers complain, if there is a problem. If not, then you don't have much security. Uh, that's one factor. Then you have the security is left in hands of uh, developers, software engineers. They are very good at building software, but then are not very good at cybersecurity. Sometimes they don't understand really basic concepts. So they are live in charge of adding, for instance, encryption, authentication, different security uh, protections to the technology because they don't have much knowledge, then the end result is not very good. What else? Uh, well, you have that the, the technology is complex because you have a huge technology uh, stack. You have many layers, you have framework, you have operating systems, uh, you have uh, Lang programming languages, you have libraries, you have a uh, third party provider, there is a long supply chain also. You have uh, a vendor that maybe the, the only thing that the vendor is doing, taking uh, different components from other vendors, putting everything together and selling that solution. But that vendor doesn't care about security or don't understand security, just taking components, putting them together, um, getting it to the, to the city. So this, uh, this is happening right now. I mean, there are some vendors that are more mature and provide more secure products, but in general, the product doesn't have much security. Then we have uh, issues related with government. You know, in government, you have politics, you have bureaucracy, which makes things uh, slower. Um, everything takes time, it takes a lot of paperwork. And when we think about security, things have to be dynamic, things have to be fast have to evolve always. Um, technology is not uh, something static, it's dynamic. So with politics, um, bureaucracy, it makes the process slower, a uh, lot of paperwork, the complicated things. And on top of that, you have a shortage of skills people. I mean, there are really smart and skilled people at the government, but not enough. And then you have this worldwide problem that there is really few skilled people available for companies and for government. But the government has a lot of less uh, economical resource, resources to attract skilled people working for them. And, and the understanding that there is that government usually is not very deep on cybersecurity. So sometimes the efforts are not put in the right things. Sometimes uh, because politics or because really bad advice, the efforts are focused on not the best solutions, so you lose time, you lose resources, and in the end, you don't have good cybersecurity. Then uh, we have uh, a growing threat. When, when you see the news, you probably see there are, every day there are different cyber attacks. Could be, mostly cyber attacks are against companies, but once in a while, uh, there are some cyber attacks targeting uh, city infrastructure, it could be a power grid, it could be a water treatment plant, it could be a nuclear plant. There have been incidents in the past and usually those incidents are uh, assigned to, to state nations that are launching those attacks. So state nations do cyber warfare, they do cyber espionage, so this is real, it's happening right now. You also have cyber crime, they look for profit, they look for ways to, to launch uh, not very costly and, and also easy attacks to get some profit for that. Maybe you have heard about ransomware, where they compromise a computer, they encrypt all the data, and they will ask the user for money in order to return the data. They will give you the decryption key so they can, after paying, they get the key and can recover the data. So think about in a city where these, the bad guys can compromise one of your city systems, encrypt everything, and tell you, okay, you have to pay me, I don't know, a thousand bitcoins, and then I will get you back that system, that data. If you don't pay, then it will remain encrypted forever. Luckily, that hasn't happened yet, but it's a possibility. Of course, you have a hacktivist, 
that you know, groups like Anonymous, they can launch cyber attacks because they don't like some, maybe some social or political decision from a government. And they are anonymous, so they are many people that use their skill to launch different kinds of cyber attacks. And then there is the possibility for cyber terrorists, because as you have seen in terrorists, uh, they recruit people with university degrees. So they use the knowledge to perform uh, terrorist acts. acts and so they could do the same people that are skilled on cybersecurity. They can use their skill to launch terrorist attacks on city infrastructure. So the, uh, this, the attacks, you may think that the, it's very difficult to perform attacks on a city, but it's not. It's very simple. For instance, think about you know, uh, services that city provides by an app. You, have, you can download several apps in a city for you know, checking the, uh, the bus uh, timing, the subway timing, taking the, I don't know, news from the city, different services. Those services are in the cloud usually. They have a, a backend, and it's very easy to cause the denial of service on, the, on those services. Uh, it probably cost you a hundred dollars an hour to take down a server, and it can be done by a teenager from his uh, uh, house living with the parents. So it's, it's very cheap and very easy to launch cyber attacks. So conclusions. Uh, Right now, cities around the world, smarter or not very smarter, depends on the level of technology they have implemented, they are vulnerable to cyber attacks because technology is not very secure. And this is a fact. And then we have a growing and evolving threat that are just waiting for targeting cities. And it's not that it's not possible, it's just that they haven't decided to start yet. I mean, you can have from one day to another, your country can start a conflict with another country and then your city could, uh, could start getting cyber attacks. Okay, that's, that's it. Thank you. Good morning. Um, so my name is Samir Saini. I'm the CIO for the city of Atlanta uh, uh, in the US. Um, I'm gonna talk about what we're doing uh, in Atlanta to make um, our city safer um, from a citizen perspective. And then I'll, I'll share some comments um, about what we're doing um, to protect ourselves from, from, the, from a cybersecurity uh, perspective. Because a lot of what we're doing to uh, make our citizens safer will include technology that will create vulnerabilities um, for us that we'll have to defend uh, against from a cyber perspective. But before I do that, I uh, just want to give some perspective around Atlanta, who we are, uh, and, and where we are. So uh, this, uh, this slide is giving you a, a, a visual of the United States um, from, um, from space. It's a NASA, uh, a NASA image um, of the U.S. at night. And you can see sort of where the, the population centers are uh, across the U.S. just by looking at the lights. Um, and uh, you'd see the, the area in the, in the southeast region that's drawn out. That's the southeast portion of the U.S., and in the circle is Metro Atlanta. That's, that's where we are. Um, I think what's interesting about this slide is it, it shows visually that there are a whole lot of folks living um, within, um, within uh, the southeast of the U.S. and Metro Atlanta. And what's perhaps more interesting uh, is that 50% of all the, the, the migrations um, happening in the U.S. are happening in the southeast region of the U.S. This is relevant for us because this means that our population is going to continue to grow, our city is going to continue to grow through urbanization. And that's going to mean transportation, the environment, public safety concerns we have today will just continue to grow as our population grows because of this trend. The, uh, the other thing that's really fueling a lot of the growth within our city is our airport. Um, so Hartsfield-Jackson International Airport is, uh, is in Atlanta. It's the busiest airport in the world. Um, this statistic saying 95 million passengers a year, but actually I think it's about 105 million uh, passengers a year. So I think the second busiest airport is Dubai. Um, sitting around uh, uh, 100 million. So this is uh, certainly fueling a lot of the, uh, the growth within our city. 
largely because Delta's uh, international global hub is based in, in Atlanta. So you know, I mentioned our, our city's growing. You know, we're seeing the data to back it up. Um, we see uh, new permit requests across our city growing. Uh, we see uh, explosive growth in new, new units, uh, residential units under construction. Uh, and we're seeing uh, jobs, uh, lots of jobs, particularly IT jobs, uh, as our city becomes a, sort of a, a tech hub uh, within the Southeast and, and in the United States. But again, this is causing issues around mobility, public safety, the environment, and those things will continue to be challenged, which means from a safety perspective, our citizens' safety is, is at risk. And if we don't address these issues now, this will become uh, a bigger problem later. So recently we um, sent out a, a survey across our citizens. We asked them what concerns them, um, what, challenge, what challenges uh, are they facing. And uh, overwhelmingly, we're seeing two, two areas of, of focus directly from our citizens. They're saying, uh, Crime and public safety is, is, uh, is number one, and transportation is number two. And safety within transportation is an issue as well, because we have uh, a, a significant issue around accidents and collisions uh, happening on our streets. This is largely because we have high degree of congestion on our major corridors. So for, for our smart city uh, uh, strategy, it starts with what areas are we trying to focus on? And this is a visual of our sort of objective model. Um, you know, it's, it's at, at the first, it's about multi-mode transport. So we, we have a addiction to cars in our city, uh, and our mayor is very focused on uh, adopting multi-mode transportation uh, principles, um, making our city bike friendly, pedestrian friendly, uh, and, and culturally shifting the city to adopt public transportation, which we don't today. Uh, and because we're very heavily reliant on, on um, getting around with, with our personal cars. Um, second, public safety, of course. Uh, third, environmental sustainability. And that's really from three lenses. Um, we're dealing with and want to focus on water management, waste management, and air quality. Um, the, the, the fourth is uh, city operational efficiency, which is um, running, running the city better and moving to more predictive maintenance. Uh, capability um, versus um, reactive uh, maintenance. Um, and that's largely through many of the, uh, the IoT uh, uh, technology infrastructure that I'll, I'll talk about in a little bit um, that should enable that, which again ties back to safety, right? Because if we can fix a traffic light before it goes out, then we can avoid a uh, potential safety uh, hazard uh, on our streets. Um, and then when we think about safety across all these pillars, we're thinking about um, equity uh, as a major factor to that. So whatever we do, we want to make sure we do across the city, not just in one part of it, um, which is a, a key, key component. So the, the approach we're taking to make uh, our city safer is really a, a, a Lean Six Sigma approach, um, which is really, uh, you know, and it's following this DMAIC sort of uh, process, which is, we can't make our, our city safer unless we first understand and quantify the degree to which it is unsafe. So that starts with, well, how do we measure that? Uh, and, and in what areas? Um, so it's really taking this, define the problem, right? Understand what, what our safety problems are, measure them. So define the KPIs, the performance metrics that, that, that quantify uh, the, 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 the safety issues within our city analyze that data um, to produce some, 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 uh, some, imp, some uh, uh, wisdom around what we can do to make our city safer, then deploy solutions to do so. And some of those solutions may be high tech, and some of them may not need any technology at all, um, but it may be basic civil engineering. But deploy those, those solutions and then ultimately measure it after it's deployed to make sure that we, we really did move the needle uh, and make our city safer um, from, from different perspectives. Um, the other approach we're taking is you know, we can't make the whole city safe uh, overnight all at once. So we want to start small um, and pick, pick uh, s portions of our city, zones or corridors that we can move the needle on and make safer. And then learn from it and then progress 
to uh, deploying those solutions across a whole district and then learn from that and then go citywide. So it's sort of a, uh, a process of, 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 uh, of piloting and demonstrating it on a small scale and then expanding to a larger scale. So what we've done is we've identified uh, six zones in our city uh, to, to uh, execute these uh, Lean Six Sigma demonstrations. Um, and again, from an equity perspective, we've picked areas of our city that are, that are all over, um, uh, both the, the uh, wealthiest uh, parts of our city and the parts of our city that are, that are not so wealthy, the, the low-income neighborhoods. Um, and there's really three areas I want to talk about that we're focused on from a safety perspective. The first is transportation, um, which is about really um, measuring the number of, of vehicle collisions and accidents that are happening within our city and then using the data we derive to figure out the root cause of what's causing those collisions and deploy solutions. So it's, it's from a transportation perspective. Um, the second is, is uh, from a police and public safety perspective, which is um, increase our situational awareness uh, through, through cameras and, and, and uh, video analytics. Uh, and then the third is from an environmental perspective of really from an air quality perspective, which is for the first time ever measuring the air quality uh, across our city and then trying to decipher from that data whether we actually have a, a, a safety issue with respect to emissions, uh, for example, right? Uh, you know, carbon monoxide or uh, you know, some uh, uh, air quality issue within pockets of our city that we can address. So across those six zones, there's one particular corridor that we're very um, uh, focused on. Um, it's, it's called North Avenue. It's a, it's a major corridor within our city, a major east-west arterial, um, and it separates two major districts um, within our city, and, th and this is uh, uh, that, that avenue. Um, and we're doing uh, uh, some, some significant demonstrations across those three areas um, to, to see, you know, again, first measure the degree to which we have safety issues on this corridor. So um, the first thing we did is I'll talk about transportation. We partnered with IBM um, to, on a, a program called Together for Safer Roads to uh, leverage Watson um, to analyze um, uh, what is causing vehicle collisions on North Avenue. So we've um, fed Watson uh, quite a bit of data, um, social media data, 911 calls, um, weather data, transit data, police reports, um, everything you can imagine that may have some influence over um, uh, an understanding of vehicle collisions on, on North Avenue. And we're, we're, we're actually in that this... Uh, analysis sort of mode right now. But I can tell you, we've, we've already you know, determined from, from Watson that um, you can see on the graph, two, two things are, are popping up that are uh, 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 highlighting what's causing vehicle collisions on North Avenue. And you can see uh, the, the two boxes there that are uh, tailgating and um, disregarding stop signs. And it's overwhelmingly those two reasons why there are vehicle collisions within, within North Avenue. Um, and you can see there's, there's other, other drivers, lane changes, um, not yielding, et cetera. But, but if we simply address the issue of tailgating and, and, and having uh, drivers acknowledge stop signs, we can make a serious improvement around reducing vehicle collisions um, within, uh, within our city. Um, we talk about mobility. We need to understand mobility on, on North Avenue. So we've installed uh, cameras that are counting cars, velocity, distance between cars, turning movements. So we can, again, baseline and understand velocity, and then we can, we can uh, address any public safety issues we have there. Um, another thing we're doing is a demonstration for autonomous vehicles. So we've issued a, uh, an RFI to, um, to focus on vehicle-to-infrastructure communications um, between a car and the traffic signal. This is important because if we can create um, this, this capability, we can make our road safer. Um, if cars automatically are aware of the signals, they'll, auto they'll stop automatically um, if there's a red light and that could cause and that could help um, keep our, our city um, safer. Because those are just some highlights. Last point I want to make is about this security piece. So um, all of this is great, but what this means is we're going to have connected traffic lights and street lights with IP addresses 
that now will be vulnerable to cybersecurity attack. Um, so great that we can make our city safer, uh, but, but what if a hacker comes in and shuts down our, our traffic lights? So one thing we're doing is partnering with our local university that has a huge cybersecurity uh, division to um, basically do vulnerability testing on an ongoing basis, uh, both at the point that we first deploy the IoT devices and then on an ongoing basis to make sure that um, we are uh, aware of any vulnerabilities after it's deployed on our right of way. So that's all, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> all right. Can I? All right. Well, hello, good morning. Um, really, really nice to meet you all. Thank you. We really appreciate your time today. Um, I'm really honored to, to be here and, and be able to, to introduce to you uh, my idea and the idea that NEC, the company that I work for, has uh, in order to make a, a city a safer place to be. So my name is Javier Concha. I am uh, I'm directing the, the cloud and IoT initiative within NEC. Um, I've been working in many, many uh, different projects worldwide for the last six years. Anyhow, to be honest, this doesn't give me any special merit. Why? Because uh, as you might know, there is no magic potion to make a city safe. There is not. Um, what we have, what I have, is kind of a vision on the path that we suggest to follow in order to, in order to achieve it. So uh, let me start the presentation. Um, uh, by, by asking you a question, I'm not going to go one by one, don't worry, I'm not going to bring you the microphone and, and make you the protagonist today, but, um, but, but I would like you to think just one second what safety means for you. So the concept of, uh, of safe city, might, some of you might be thinking about urban crime, others about cybersecurity, as you were commenting, maybe natural disasters or, or the pollution and how that affects health in the, in the city. Well. As you can see, there are a lot, a lot of different factors. There's a variety of things that might affect how the city, how the city performs and works. So having that, that fan of, uh, of, uh, of things to be taken into account, how to address this? Well, let me start by a very, very silly example, which is pro probably most of you know this, uh, this girl. Her name is Snow White. Uh, you know, I know by heart the story of this girl because my five-year-old daughter uh, makes me watch this film once and again. So I can tell you that, uh, that this girl was one day in the woods. She was kind of hungry, you know, and a very nice woman approached her and offered her an apple. So what did she do? If you remember the story, she bit it, didn't she? But well, this is not a good thing. Why? Because she, she got sick, she, got, she, she fell asleep and all this stuff. But what is the mistake there? Have you ever analyzed this? Of course not, yeah. <laughs> so the, the mistake here is that she only took into account one source of information, which was her sight. He saw the apple, the apple was shiny, was bright, and she, and she beat it. Well, imagine, imagine a situation where this girl had taken into account more sources of information. If she could have smelled the, the apple, so look the way that that apple was cooked. It, I'm sure it stank. So uh, imagine this, this situation where she could have not this, uh, this, this source of information, but apply some little bit of technology. So she, have, she might have heard from social networks that there was a witch in town, or she might have also heard that there was a new amazing recipe on how to prepare poison apples. <laughs> so um, this, in the end, probably wouldn't have made the, the, the story different. But what would have made the story different is if she could have applied some predictions. So imagine if she, could, she would have been able to apply a prediction and say, what will happen if I eat the apple? Doesn't look very appealing, does it? Okay, and, and in the opposite, if we don't eat, if I don't eat the apple, ah, cool. Then I, I think I think I'm gonna take this option. So, again, this is a very silly example, and and what I'm trying to show you to show you today is that, okay, the story is not gonna change for this girl. But what about our cities? So, is is our cities following the same approach where they are trying to address the problem just from one single perspective? Well, our idea is that the cities should have a more holistic view and take into account multiple factors in order to address this thing of the safety. And, but well, okay, as I was mentioning, there are a, a big variety of factors, so how to take into account many sources of information and how to, and how to m make, it, make them worthwhile. So uh, we suggest to follow a very simple approach, which is following the way that our human body works. So how do we work? We have lots of sensors. We have our eyes, our ears, as I was mentioning with the Snow White. Uh, we have our hands. All our body is a sensor indeed. And what happens with that information? It goes to one single place. Can you tell me what place it is? Our brain, isn't it? 
everything goes to our brain, our brain takes decisions and then uh, sends the orders to the rest of the body. So why shouldn't a, a, a city work in the same way? Well, this is exactly what NEC proposes. Cities have lots and lots and lots of information coming from multiple sources. One is security, other one is transport, other one is pollution. Why not bring in all that information into a brain, which is called in, the, in this slide city platform, and this brain can cross that information, learn about what is happening, comprehend it, and thus make the right decisions. And those decisions being sent to the different verticals that I'm, that I'm, trying, to, that I'm trying to improve in the city. But well, this is, this is one perspective, having this brain, having the city, the city brain in the middle. But it's also true that all these different sources of information typically uh, speak different languages. And this is a challenge, isn't it? So imagine a, 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 an emergency in a city. Well, in an emergency in a city, well, my colleagues know better than me. But uh, this, this will activate the, the police, will uh, activate medical services, utilities, telecommunications. And all these agencies have their technologies, their systems, and their way to speak. So how to make all of them interact and collaborate? Well, what, we, what is being defined in the European Union, and NEC is part of it, is one standard called FIWORD. You might have seen the, the stand outside in the, in, the, in the fair. And this FIWORD tries to define and start to develop and deploy solutions for what they call future internet. And the, the area of future internet is very wide, but one of the specific things that they are talking about is safety and smart cities. So uh, again, this is a standard, and this is a standard that's been followed, for instance, in Spain. You know, the, the, the Secretary of State, which is Victor Calvo Sotelo, was talking uh, uh, some weeks ago that they, uh, they are really keen on implementing FIWARE because, again, this is a common platform, and from the public administration perspective, this will bring a lot of benefit as, as because as long as you develop something that is according to FIWARE, you will be able to change it and exchange it with other cities and other companies. So with this, we can achieve this collaboration between multiple agencies that we are looking for. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish the, this area of the presentation just by telling you some examples, because I was telling you that, that we, have some, uh, we have some experiences worldwide. Well, um, I was looking recently to the, this index from, uh, from, uh, from the economies. As you can see there, the two, the two safest cities in the world are Tokyo and Singapore. Um, well, I don't know if you, if you are aware of it, but NEC is a Japanese company, so we are, we are applying some of our technologies in these cities, and, and we are proud to, to say that we are helping these cities become, uh, become the, the safest. Um, this, this, is, this is really wide, so I, I was mentioning at the beginning, uh, there are many different areas, and, and within NEC there are like 500 use cases that, that I can explain about how to address this thing of the safety, but I would like to highlight just some of them. Uh, the first one has to do with the city of Santander, which is really close. If you have the chance, please take a car and go drive uh, three hours, and, and you will go there, and, and you will see how amazing it is. Uh, what is differential from this city is that they already have 12,000 sensors monitoring lots of things. So they are monitoring temperature, they are monitoring pollution, they are monitoring traffic, they are, they are, of course, their camera, the CCTV system. And what we have done there is, again, put this brain in the middle. All this information is being, is being stored in the brain, is being analyzed, and is generating amazing insights for the city of Santander. Uh, similar approach we have following Wellington. Uh, I don't know if you are aware, but Wellington is the city where Peter Jackson recorded the Lord of the Rings. So you know if a city needs to keep safe, is this is Wellington because it has the eye of Sauron there <laughs> looking at everyone. And in this city, again, they are applying the same concept of the city platform of the brain. What they have bring this idea to a next level, which is they are giving that service to the cities around. So they are generating some money out of, out of uh, an investment that they have done in order for, in order for this, this city to be more secure. So they are bringing this concept of a smart nation, and Wellington is providing solutions to the cities of Auckland and Christchurch, again, based on the platform. And, uh, and the last, the last um, use case that I want to mention is about the city of Tigre in, in Argentina. In this city, we do, we do run a, a safety operations center um, that, is, uh, that is taking care of um, public transport, is taking care also uh, of public schools, and, and is applying some, some video analytics in order to prevent crime. Uh, indeed, you can see there are a ratio of 80% decrease in the, in, the, um, in the area of car theft. Uh, but the, the concept is exactly the same. So we are not addressing the problem from, from one perspective, but again, keeping as much information as possible in one single place, and from there, uh, generating this, uh, these insights. So just to, just to finish, I was mentioning at the beginning, how, how, would, you call, uh, how would you define um, a safe city? Well, from our perspective, and this is the message that I want to deliver today, a safe city should have a, a platform, an IT platform that and that keeps all the information and brings all the information into one place and, uh, and establish a standard for, for all the agencies and all the sources of information to be able to communicate and collaborate. 
and coming uh, using this using this quote from uh, from a friend of mine, which is called Mark, so the chief officer. Uh, I think this is the key. So the the the, the idea of a safe city or, or the, our idea of safe city is hey, no, not to catch the guy who stole the Porsche. I don't care. Uh, I don't care about that. I don't want the, the 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 guy. What I do not want is the guy to to to, to have the idea to steal the Porsche. So to prevent what is going to happen. So um, just if I can give you a call to action today, uh, in the same way that I was telling I was telling uh, with uh, with Snow White, I will say, hey, if you do have to define a strategy for the safety in your city, please take into account that a silo view of the problem might might be keeping you from uh, from a from a, a wider and, and and more valuable insight. And if you like this approach and and you think it's right. Uh, here at NC, we do have the expertise, we do have the technology, and we do have the willingness to, to partner with you and go with you along the way to make your city safe, and most of all, to make the city more, more enjoyable. So thank you very much for your time today. I'll be looking forward to answering any question that, that you might have. Cheers. Good morning, everyone. We had to activate it. We look at the guy on the corner and we activate it. Fred. Fred, now. Good morning, everyone. Now that we have had some chance to listen to my colleagues, uh, they talked about cybersecurity. Uh, Atlanta talked about cities planning, uh, many uh, fa facets of security and issues that deals with um, public safety. We also had um, Argentina talk about various important concepts of what is uh, sa safety, security, and ha Snow White was out there with a red apple, and apple could be poison, right, if you've heard about the story. So I represent Los Angeles Police Department, and uh, Los Angeles Police Department is one of the largest organizations in the nation, um, in the United States, as a police department. We have over 10,000 police officers and 3,000 um, civilians working together to reduce crime, uh, reduce fear, uh, track um, uh, any events that could be a um, threat to the public, to our citizens. So you, you probably would be wondering what does police department do um, and what measures do we take, uh, in initiatives do we have in order to reduce crime and keep the citizens safe. Well, uh, it is not simple. It is difficult uh, process because uh, law enforcement has to be in a middle where um, at one hand you have to uh, respect citizens' privacy, uh, their, their res respect their uh, rights, uh, and in every country they have different rights, but uh, uh, eventually citizens do have uh, their rights where we can't infringe on. And then on the other hand, we have to be aggressive, we have to be smart, we have to be quick to uh, respond to threats and uh, also deal with uh, issues that could uh, uh, create harm to citizens. So um, technology is all around us and it does affect um, uh, law enforcement agents uh, too. So how do, what do we do exactly to reduce crime or reduce free fear? First of all, uh, Los Angeles Police Department uh, has uh, um, invested large resources in monitoring uh, cyberspace. Cyberspace is a great opportunity to learn what is happening out there. Normally you can hear lots of chatter, a lot of video, a lot of tweets, a lot of web pages, what is going on. And learning that also gives us the opportunity to prevent. Prevention is a key in law enforcement if we could predict where the next attack could happen, if we could predict what is causing uh, some of the uh, crime rates that increase, then we could actually take preventive measures. There is two things we really do right now in Los Angeles. We are very metrics driven, uh, like any other paramilitary or military organization, we monitor data a lot. After we monitoring the data, we analyze it and determine what our actions should be next in order to prevent crime. So we have algorithms and companies working with us to determine 
where would the next crime occur? And as a result, we, it's called predictive policing. As a result, our officers are directed to spend more time in those areas and monitoring. So we use video cameras, we use uh, cyberspace uh, chatter, we use um, uh, uh, algorithms that calculate what uh, crime could be occurring where next, and as such, we sent our resources there to prevent that, to deter crime. Another method we use also is uh, after the crime occurs. We measure what type of uh, crime occurs, where it occurs, why it, uh, it occurred, and then we spend more time in those areas. We call it dosage. As we spend more time in those areas, we kind of start to dissipate the crime to another area or uh, prevent, basically, crime to get any bigger. Um, it's, it's, it is, uh, unfortunately, often uh, we have to deal with uh, uh, safety and security after it has been violated. But every time that uh, we learn of some, something that has occurred in a continuous manner, uh, then we take preventive measures and build a net around that so it does not occur again. So one of the biggest things that Los Angeles Police Department also does is education. So we talk about smart city, we talk about smart citizens. Uh, it is very important to educate citizens how to be safe. Because number one, uh, every individual has ability to protect themselves. Whether it's leaving your vehicle unprotected, parking the vehicle in an area where it's not supposed to be, or uh, actually even protecting yourself. Don't go into places where there is more crime during certain hours. Uh, you need to kind of be aware of the situation, like um, having your wallet or personal belongings in a vehicle and uh, not locking your doors. So these are things that actually creates adds to the crime. So being smart citizen, using technology also to understand where to go, when to go, uh, how to behave, it actually has a phenomenal in, uh, impact on crime reduction. So uh, while we're teaching this to our kindergarten kids from a younger age, uh, because millennials, that's what we call our younger generation, uh, are very savvy with technology. They use their iPhones, they use their TVs, they use their technology available to them faster, better than any one of our previous generations. So we're trying to use the technology to educate kids from a younger age. And we're giving them two or three or five different uh, simple steps so they can learn how to protect themselves, how to recognize threat, and how to respond to difficult situations and who to call. Um, since um, uh, uh, police departments normally operate on dispatching, so, so not only they're dispatched uh, to various areas and operate and uh, provide service, but often um, we also operate on emergencies. Uh, Los Angeles uh, uh, uses 911, a number that we normally call, that's the emergency call. We get uh, life-threatening calls over several million a year and we have to respond on all of them. And our response rate is very important. So to process, the minute the call comes in and the minute we're able to understand where the threat is, what kind of need they have, our response rate is minimum uh, or maximum is eight minutes. So if you call a police officer, uh, uh, call for emergencies anywhere in the city, any time of the day, uh, we will respond uh, uh, in eight minutes. Now, you might think, well, eight minutes is a very long time, but you have to understand, uh, this is a city of 480 miles square, and it, there's a lot of uh, crime, there's lots of incidences, and not enough police officers. But um, response rate is very important also. So in order to reduce the response rate, we're also using technologies such as telematics, um, and we're able to see where our officers are and what is the best and most efficient way to reach our citizens in order to render the first aid and uh, uh, assistance. So um, uh, in closing, what I'd like to say is uh, te technology is a double-edged sword. 
At one hand, it offers you lots of solutions, but on the other hand, it also opens opportunities for crime, opens opportunities for vulnerability, and therefore every citizen has the uh, most important process here is to guard yourself, guard your neighbor, and be a good citizen. Thank you very much. <clears throat> <clears throat> Well, thank you all of you. I think we are lucky that we still have 15 minutes as expected for questions uh, from the audience or from further discussions. It's your time now uh, on the floor. If you want to raise uh, any questions, you can go to the microphone, if you will. No one? No? And if not, let's see if maybe there are some shy people out there. I think we have, uh, well, two good questions that are have been probably been addressed specific specifically uh, from your um, uh, address, but I think it Im are important. I mean, probably in the introduction we mentioned that we are facing uh, an issue that is uh, multidimensional, and most of you um, uh, remarked this, this, well, problem of this feature of uh, safety concerns in cities and uh, something that is has to be approached from different perspectives. Uh, but at the same time, we have to uh, still keep in mind that the m this year's uh, Congress motto uh, is about uh, cities for citizens, and there's a, a, a question here basically um, wondering what's the role of citizens in building safer uh, communities. I think it's something that we can go um, deeper uh, now. What's your uh, ideas about the how citizens can be uh, well linked to these uh, efforts on building safer cities? And at the same time, probably I'm thinking uh, of you, Cesar, thinking about the way privacy is more and more understood as something that is changing somehow and how privacy concerns um, can understood and in a broader perspective from uh, cities, city services, what, what, what are your ideas basically about that? Yeah. So um, I, th I think one key uh, uh, thing citizens can do to make cities safer is um, it's crowdsourcing, right? So it's, you know, citizens are powerful, right? Because there's more citizens than there are police, right? Um, and that's eyes and ears, right, uh, all over our city. So um, when you think about it from, t take a transportation perspective, you know, um, uh, you know there's uh, solutions out there like Google Ways um, where citizens can self-report incidents um, that are happening on, on, our, on our streets. And that's for the benefit of others, uh, other drivers, right? So that, that the power of uh, every citizen sharing and exposing what's happening uh, from a transportation perspective is, is happening now, and that's making our cities safer. Um, from a public safety perspective, it's the same thing. You know, citizen, there's now apps um, being deployed where citizens can report uh, uh, public safety threats, um, and, um, and that's uh, you know, uh, creating more awareness, situational awareness, that, that may be a better solution, quite honestly, than deploying uh, CCTV cameras uh, on every street corner. Um, just use the use your citizens, right, as your eyes and ears. Um, and uh, so I think those are probably two examples, right, of where citizens uh, themselves can make um, for a safer city. Yeah. I, I agree absolutely with you. I will co uh, complement that in that the, what I was mentioning uh, during the presentation that uh, indirectly citizens are providing a lot of information, but uh, they are providing it through the, the normal channels, which are social networks. So in a daily basis, we are communicating what we are living, what we are doing, and, uh, and low, low enforcement. And indeed, indeed uh, probably there, is, uh, there are initiatives uh, in, uh, in your areas, and in Spain there are, where they are leveraging more and more on, uh, on these uh, social networks and gathering information from social networks in order to, in order to be able to, you know, to, to um, 
detect crimes and prevent crimes and also for, for any kind of, uh, of investigation. And from our perspective, again, the idea is the same, is um, in order to address one specific problem, try to get information from as many sources as possible, and one of those sources are our social networks. And citizens are absolutely key. Well, I think uh, citizens should get more familiar with the importance of cybersecurity nowadays because you know, we depend on technology, so if we don't properly protect it, then we suffer the consequences. As a citizens, if we don't request the government, okay, you are incorporating new solutions, new technology, but do it in a secure way. Make sure that the technology is secure. Um, we won't get uh, problems later when we have uh, cyber attacks because the in the end, the one suffering the consequences will be the, the citizen. They probably won't have a, you know, if the street uh, lighting system is attacked, then you will have dark uh, street <coughs> at night. If the traffic control system are hacked, then you will have problems in traffic. So the end user in a city is the citizen. So it's start with education, learning, okay, now we depend so much on technology that we need to understand how to properly protect it. And it starts from the citizen to learn first and then ask the government to provide <coughs> secure services. Mm -hmm. Now, that's why I was, well, trying to reframe or, uh, or understand the question about the privacy concerns that was raised from the audience. It's basically because, um, uh, I mean, it's really clear that our uh, personal or societal perspective on privacy is changing. Um, we could go into a generational shift or whatever we call it, but things are changing in the way we are intera interacting with our, with our own devices, with our own data. We are getting, well, more uh, dependent uh, from third parties, uh, services, clouds, you know, there's no cloud, there's, it's, how is it? Uh, there's no cloud, it's someone else's computer. These kind of problems that are changing our mans mindsets and how is this affecting as citizens the kind of things we can expect from, uh, uh, from the re reliability of, of, of our data, or of our, our public data and how is it uh, used from public services. It's all, how, how do you see it? It's a dystopian vision in which we as citizens are getting lost in this, well, let's call it, I don't know, nightmare threats, uh, um, mm, problems with issues that will uh, or are starting to appear in uh, regarding the vulnerability of uh, public services, the vulnerability of or, their, or the unreliability of our uh, cities. I mean, th that's one of the things I, I think we really have to keep in mind uh, in the coming future. We as citizens are becoming more, we'll, we'll, we will become more engaged with this kind of problems or we will start seeing it as something that is happening somewhere else and we have no power to, to, to control it. Okay. Privacy is a very important topic and there is a lot of debate about it. And, and with technology, it becomes very easy to collect information, to process it, and um, besides being easy, it gets cheaper. So it's kind of impossible to prevent data to be collected and processed. And with the use of technology, we leave tracks and fingerprint, digital fingerprint everywhere. We just um, answer a phone call, and we are connecting to the cellular network. We are transmitting information over there, so anyone can capture that, can take maybe the brand of the, or our phone, and you can see what Wi-Fi network we use at home because our cell phone is broadcasting the um, the Wi-Fi network name. And, and with a cell phone, you are leaving track everywhere, so it's very easy to collect and and then probably give some meaning to the information. So focusing in preventing the collage the the collection of information, I think it's a mistake because it's really difficult to enforce that. I think uh, government should try to enforce more regulations and laws on how the data is being used and by whom. So you have to focus, okay, you can collect a lot of data if you want, but you have to tell me, okay, what are you going to do with that data and who is going to, to use it and, um, and how? Because uh, 
as a citizen, I really don't care if I, someone is collecting the data I produce digitally, but what I care is what they are doing with that and who is accessing that. Because you know, the government has a lot of information about citizens. Depends on the country, they have your tax information, your date of birth, yeah. they have information about your family. So you trust your government because you trust the, the information is going to be used in a, in a secure way, in a safe way. It won't be abused. But then with the, uh, it can be abused anyways, and also by companies. So if you try to, to enforce regulations, on laws, say, okay, collect the information, but don't abuse it uh, and make uh, uh, proper authorization of who is as accessing <coughs> the data and for what, uh, log everything, have an audit trail of that, then you can help with privacy because it's not like, okay, you collect the data and you can do whatever you want with that. So with regulations and law, I think we can improve the, the privacy at least. Uh, more than we are right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, for, for Atlanta, I could talk to our city. Um, uh, to that point, there's two things we're doing to address this. So the first is um, we're issuing in the next month um, a privacy policy um, to our citizens for public comment. Um, because we want before, and this is before we deploy these um, uh, very advanced um, sensors, right, on, on a right of way. So, so we want to make sure that citizens are aware of exactly what these, uh, these uh, IoT devices are doing, what data they're collecting, um, how we're ensuring that the data that we do collect is anonymized. Um, and, and, and critical, we do all this before we, do, we deploy anything on the right of way. So that's, that's key, awareness, right, and getting input from citizens. So we're about to do that. Um, the other thing is, to your point about um, suppliers, so we have many suppliers <laughs> uh, coming to our city um, in the IoT smart city space that are, um, are, are uh, contractually uh, including language that allows them to use the, the data um, to, to well, aren't being clear about exactly how they're, w to what degree they're collecting, right, the data from their IoT you know, solution and how they're, going, how they're using the data um, uh, in different ways. So what we're having to do is, number one, go back to existing contracts that we've signed um, with uh, many of these vendors to relook at the, the data, uh, the data use uh, you know, clauses and evaluate whether it is actually what, in line with our policy. Um, and then renegotiate those clauses because, unfortunately, um, we've been moving so quickly that there may have been, uh, we haven't been so careful, right, about uh, use, use of data. And many cities, particularly small cities, are falling prey, right, to, to this because they don't have the resources, right, to, to uh, look in detail, right, over these very small, you know, uh, you know, clauses on the last page of a hundred-page contract that says that the company they just signed a deal with can can go ahead and, you know, do some very scary things that citizens would 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 be afraid of. The other thing is going forward, have specific language around that ties to our privacy policy on data use, um, that we would um, embed in every future <coughs> contract. Um, so that's a big that's a big thing that that uh, we're we're, mm. we're doing. Yeah, sorry, we are running out of time, and I really want to well make use of two more questions. <coughs> and a specific one for uh, Javier, who owns and manages uh, the city platforms. And the second one, uh, more general one, well, but I think it's very crucial, is safety, a new kind uh, of inequality. How could we avoid this conflict? I mean, it's quite general and... and, and and deep, but I think it's also worthwhile uh, talking about that in the, I guess, two minutes we have before we somewhere else, someone else goes. I'll answer the uh, second question, the safety and inequality. Uh, so um, uh, Los Angeles makes sure that um, all the safety features of the uh, great city is applied evenly and equitably to all the citizens. Um, unfortunately, m most of the victims and crimes uh, in the city sometimes occur in areas where um, 
uh, e economically less uh, um, well-off uh, community is living. And that, 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 that could be based on um, uh, yeah, social economic uh, standards. But um, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the way the city is designing its security and safety and prevention, it always puts more effort in the areas where there is um, uh, more crime and there is more uh, hazard to the citizens. Uh, because those efforts need to be mitigated and corrected, and therefore the resources are applied to those areas. Um, so um, the inequality of safety is, is a bigger picture. It is not technological, because technology is governed by people. No matter how smart the technologies are, the technologies are designed by people and are managed by people, and people are influenced by politics. So this is something that I don't want to venture today. It's a different topic. Mm -hmm. But I think as <coughs> citizens, uh, the biggest effect you can have on your living of standards, on your security, is be to engage and to expect uh, the government and city planners and engineers and law enforcement to deliver the, what they promise to deliver. Okay. Just very quick to mention about um, because I, I was uh, I was trying to introduce to you the idea of the horizontal platform, which is the, the thing that we really believe. So going around the the Congress, you might have seen that there are a lot of verticals, smart ways, smart water, etc. Indeed, originally in NEC there that there was that approach, but when we started talking to, to the cities and we, we understood that that this um, this view uh, is is not working. It's not working because it's uh, it's reducing efficiency. There are are lots of things that can be reused. Imagine just the image of one camera that is on the street uh, recording traffic. That, that camera is being used by one agency, which is a traffic agency, and it's leveraging it. Okay, fantastic. You know if there is, cra is, uh, is heavy traffic or not, and then you know if one car is speeding or not. But that, si that same image can be used for multiple agencies and multiple, and multiple purposes. Like, for instance, is there a trash bin there, and are there bags around the trash bin? Maybe the, the ones that have to collect the trash should go to the, there because it's going to start being smelly. And uh, have someone left um, near a, a public uh, building or a bench a bag that shouldn't be there, but maybe police should be uh, should be aware of that. So uh, the, the idea the idea that I try to convey today is that uh, the, the information is uh, is really worthy for many different areas, and as long as you can keep it in one place, and that place uh, can be can, can be consulted by these different agencies, um, we, we are bringing this to a different level. Just one more thing, uh, because you were mentioning about data privacy and who's the owner of the data. Uh, from the to give you the, the perspective of the provider, I belong to a provider, and data belongs to the city and to the citizen. So for us, the technology is just uh, an, an alibi. So we give it to you, and, and that data so belongs to you. Mm -hmm. and, and in terms of the privacy, I think that, that the citizen won't care that much about privacy as long as you give them value behind. Because uh, the same way, very silly example, as Google works. So we do not care too much if Google knows that my trip to, to Barcelona is on Wednesday because Google is giving me it's, uh, information about nearby hotels, restaurants. It's telling me if the flight is delayed or not. And it's, that's bringing me a value as a citizen. If we can do the same, but from the perspective of the security and, uh, and all the city services, I don't think there's going to be much, much issue. And of course, regulations have to be there. Okay, thank you. I'm afraid I have to close the session. Um, so many challenges for a topic that has so many approaches, so many uh, issues related. I think we had the chance, well, to at least uh, surface uh, some of them and understand that we have to, uh, uh, in our uh, in our homes, in our cities, and in the Congress go deep into these kind of uh, topics that, ha that are part of the, of the Smart City agenda. I hope you enjoyed this hour, and I really appreciate your, uh, your effort in being uh, concise and precise in your contributions. Thanks for your attentions, and see you around. Thank you. <laughs>